there are a lot of these wellness trends um, in fashion these days. Uh, you know, these cold baths and intermittent fasting, journaling at 5 a.m. And then I don't know if you know about this GRW, get ready with me. I mean, eight-year-old children are making these vlogs where they are getting ready for school and they are using mascara and 10-step creams, you know, for skincare, toners. And I just remember I would just wash my face growing up with some cream and that'll be all. And um, so what do you think about these wellness trends, especially intermittent fasting? Is it for everyone or, you know, it should be prescribed by the doctor? Yeah, I, I think, look, it's more about calorie restriction, like I said earlier. We consume too many calories. So in my view, however you reduce your calories, it's better for you. So in that way, intermittent fasting helps. Or, or in that way, not so. So, for example, I'll give you an example. So, I have breakfast, and then I don't really normally I don't eat much during the day, right? And I'll go till evening. So, technically, then I'll I'll have you know lemon and honey drinks kind of stuff or whatever. But the reality is, but you're working a busy day all day, right? It becomes a form of it's not really intermittent fasting, but it becomes a form of calorie restrictions, which you can say the gap between your meals is quite long, right? So that is shown to be beneficial, but everything else is then a fad. I don't think, but certainly then the same thing would go for whether it's a paleo or a keto diet or a protein diet. In those things, there is a genetic predisposition, like in my lab here on the gene test, so we can we can pick the people for whom a high protein diet would be beneficial if you want to lose weight, but it doesn't work for everyone. So you can't say, so your metabolism may be different and your friend may have a high protein diet and lose weight and you may like, I want to do that. And everyone's like that, they're doing it, I want to do it. It won't work for you because for some people it would work and we can, and if you want to take the next level, obviously we can fine tune it, we can get your gene type tested, we know. But the reality is the only reason intermittent fasting works is because the gap between meals and you're consuming less calories. So even if you did it normally by having not eating too frequently, not consuming too many calories, I think you would pretty much get the same benefit. And um, what was the other question you asked me after the intermittent fasting? The get ready with cold, me, that is cold terrible. Baths. Oh, a cold baths, actually, I remember putting a post about it. A cold baths actually is more from a point of view of feeling better about like, I looked at ice baths particularly after exercise to see if it really had a specific metabolic benefit in reducing the lactic acid buildup and that's the reason why people were doing it. But what studies have shown is it's actually not that it actually doesn't do any of that. It's just that when the muscles are hot and you're sore or you're playing contact sport or lots of G-force, whatever, like your Formula One, whatever, it does help your symptoms because of the fact that suddenly you're on cold and it cools it all down, especially after exercise and things like that. So the benefit is more from little muscle recovery as opposed to it, it helping, uh, you know, in a great way. So, so the same thing goes, you know, sometimes it's cold baths, sometimes it's hot baths, right? Like, you know, saunas, things. So, so the reality is it is just anything which alters your temperature, alters your metabolism a bit. And it's a key thing like we know that intense exercise, short bursts even helps. So we know that if somebody does 45 minutes a week or one and a half hours a week of intense exercise, be it like, you know, running, whatever, it actually helps. Right. So, for example, studies were done when you compare people who were not sleeping as well. So if you look at, when people say, you know, when you sleep, your brain computer reboots or sleep is so important. But if you don't sleep enough, um, so I was actually worried about it because I write my books often at night and I'm not a big sleeper. And I was like, oh, look, my dad has Alzheimer's. I was like, I'm screwed, right? But what I find is that I run a bit, maybe twice a week I run like 10 k's or whatever. But what I find is that when you run or you do that kind of intense exercise, it actually nullifies all the adverse effects of you not getting enough sleep. So, so there are lots of other things why... So I think the reason why 
a hot bath or a cold bath also is it changes your temperature of your body. So then there are metabolic effects associated with it. So I think in a short term, there are but you can't have that in isolation without having the rest of it. So if you're having, if you're doing exercise and having a cold bath, that's fine. If you're doing, you know, other things, exercise, various things, then you're sitting in a sauna, that's fine as well. But I just think it's not just sitting in there is going to make you healthy. Doctor, you just said you go for a 10K run. Um, people also say that it's really bad for your knees. Is that true? It is true in the sense that now I find, and again, there's, there should be a level of self. So what I find now is I used to be able to do a bit longer, but I find that now as you get a bit older, I find that if I cross over past 12K, then my knees start hurting, so I cut back. But what's interesting is you can actually do specific exercises which re take the load off by building muscle around your knee so therefore your knee doesn't take so much load but, but having said that look in life as we get more active we will develop arthritic stuff and things like that and yes everybody will have a degree no one goes through life when you're older with no pain right it's a fact of life but the fitter you keep yourself the rest of it becomes easier. You have less back pain, you have less things. And the real reason these things weren't spoken about even 50 years ago or 100 years ago is because people didn't live that long. Yeah. Right. So what I mean is before, by the time your knee is packed up and all that, you are gone, right? So whereas now we're living longer. So the reality is, yeah, absolutely. I think it's more damaging only on really extreme. So if I push myself now beyond, so when I know, so you need to listen to me. So when I'm going beyond 10, I now know that my knee will start hurting. So I just keep it at that, right? But it still gives you a really good workout or you can do shorter bursts. But the reality is, yes, but there is a lot of benefits to that because it, of your aerobic fitness, of your rest, of you. So I think, I quite love it. And it's a natural human thing. Like any leg movement exercise is a natural human thing. Like when we started off as human beings, we walked and we ran from predators and things like that, right? And so a lot of the things evolution biology helps us understand, like it's the most natural thing for human beings because we're two-legged is walking yeah. and running, things like that. And if you look at, there weren't any devices and things like that. I think one of the other problems now are there two um, device bound and to indoors and not doing enough. So, like I said, biohacking your genes, a study is done from urbanization of populations being indoors in the last 20 years has had a 600% rise in autism and that kind of autism spectrum kind of. And we know it's also linked to vitamin D levels, but we also know it is linked to the fact that people are inside, they're not outside enough. Yeah. So we're not getting enough sunshine, yeah, we're not getting enough I movement. Earlier, you know, you said that in India, mostly people are uh, vitamin D deficient. And um, India is a hot country, most of India. Uh, why do you think that is? And how can we overcome it? Is is the supplement the solution? Yeah, I think in in India, like I said, unless proven otherwise from a blood test or something, I've never come across somebody who naturally had high vitamin D levels, right? Unless you had a metabolic problem, like some hormone problem, generally. So two things, where do we get vitamin D from? So that's one of the reasons why vitamin D is a um, hormone and not a vitamin, like I said, is literally because technically vitamin by the name comes from vital amine, which is vitamin is something which you don't produce in your body, therefore you have to take externally. Of course, we produce vitamin D from sunlight, so we produce it in the body. So for that, we have to be exposed to the sun, right? But, but in India, I think the biggest, so that's one. So the one of the biggest reasons in India people avoid the sun is they don't want to go darker skinned or tan. It's not so much the heat, because you know, even in the colder parts of India, so people avoid the sun, right? Or, or if you look at vitamin D absorption, you roughly need even 20 minutes a day it can be off-peak uh, UV, so you're not really going to tan as much, but the key thing should be 20 minutes and 20% 20 of your body surface area exposed. So what that means is like T-shirt and shorts kind of distribution, but in India, people aren't doing that as well. So, so that automatically puts you at a higher risk of not absorbing enough vitamin D. 
Then the next thing is the large vegetarian population, right? So if you look at dietary sources of vitamin D, then the highest ones are fish like cod is very high and salmon, particularly cod, each teaspoon has 1,200 international, international units of vitamin D and salmon is about 300, so it's very high. Right, so if you're eating that kind of fish, then you don't need a supplement because it's like taking a supplement. So if you're not doing that, and then you have to supplement. So I think it's not a bad idea, I would say. In, in India, I would actually be in favor of making sure people have optimal vitamin D levels.